Hello and welcome to Any Means Necessary, the information design podcast where we explore past and present design problems by any means necessary. My name is Shadi Swedan, and today I'm joined by my fellow classmates. Hi, I'm April. Hi, I'm Arthur. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Hey, Kirk here. Hi, I'm Laura. Hey, I'm Wyatt. Beautiful. And today we will be discussing all problems, experiences, and tips relating to instructional design, both inside and outside of the info design program, including the contemporization of techniques. Before we begin today, we would like to remind everyone listening that we are in no way experts on the topics being discussed, but rather speak on our personal and collective experiences in the information design program at Mount Royal University and beyond. With that being said, I will pass the mic over to Kirk, who will get us started on instructional design. Yeah, so it's my turn today. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I, I, anyone that knows me, yeah, I get into a, a lot of depth about my career. I'm pretty proud of kind of how diverse it's been. You know, I went from uh, cartoon animation with the hopes of becoming a video game animator, uh, which uh, in turn I got absorbed by the film industry where I didn't more than just films. Uh, some of our bread and butter work was in creating websites, interactives, uh, flash animations, uh, doing some creative stuff on those avenues. So uh, I suppose I've always been kind of uh, caught up with uh, contemporary coding and things like that. Uh, I'm not by any stretch of the mind or imagination a uh, professional code uh, person whatsoever, but uh, I've always kind of boasted that I'm a great copy-paste coder, if that makes sense. Caitlin, I know you've done a lot of websites, so maybe you know what I mean on the JavaScript angle. You know, you kind of find that code to make a window pop up or drop down or things like that. Absolutely, yeah. I'm yeah. a big fan of copy paste JavaScript. So yeah, you're you're becoming just like me. I hope that uh, inspires you to be better out there. <laughs> uh, and I know that's a funny joke, but anyway. So uh, yeah, so when I was on my career path or whatever, it was it was interesting because. Uh, when I decided that uh, the film industry or creative industry wasn't for me anymore, I got absorbed by uh, corporate entities, actually. I did a lot of contract work, uh, and I was brought in under the banner of being a uh, technical writer slash developer. And so there's a lot of companies that needed uh, e-learning. Uh, development uh, to be done. Uh, I was also part of the crew that would actually do a lot of in-class training, synchronous training, things like that. And uh, I'll be honest, I think I just faked it till I made it, if that makes sense, right? Because uh, I found myself uh, to be well accepted actually out there in the field. Uh, and I think really what I brought uh, that was unique to the table uh, during that during that time frame was just really personality. I I understood what people were looking for. Uh, in terms of, you know, knowledge or information, you know, I understood or had empathy to what the problems they were trying to solve. You know, for example, I was a big uh, fan of Excel because people were just so confused or intimidated by the interface. But uh, I really enjoyed uh, being that person that kind of took them through the, the ins and outs in, in an introductory path. And they just thought it was brilliant. They had a great time and so on and so forth. So, um when I came into, uh, uh, I guess, a decision point in my career, uh, I decided to come back to MRU. So, you know, that's it in a nutshell. That's why I'm here. Uh, a little more seasoned than, you know, someone fresh out of high school, needless to say. But, uh, yeah, I've had a really good, uh, good reflection, I guess, as to whether or not I've taken the right, uh, I guess, uh, faculty or if I decided the right uh, approach or the right kind of schooling or in, uh you know, uh, post-secondary education, I guess. And uh, I really needed a degree out there to, to advance my career. And I decided, uh, yeah, information design was for me. And I think I, I struck gold, to be honest with you. I think it was bang on. It was a perfect convergence of, uh, you know, my design skills and expertise in that, in that field and creative industry, I suppose. And of course, my desire to get more in depth with uh, uh, corporate training and UX design, you know, in the future of whatever, you know, virtual reality, I always bring that up, uh, how we're going to teach people. And I get a real big buzz out of teaching people, you know, we get that whole, whatever, that whole empathy path and stuff like that. And uh, anyone that knows me, I know I, I talk too much, I guess, but I'm always so full of information. I always want to share it. And I really enjoy when people uh, get a lot of good information out of me. So, uh I guess, uh, yeah, what I'd like to kind of talk about regarding our path with uh, information design and, and information design students at MRU is, uh, yeah, I have really got a good blast out of the tech writing class, uh, information architecture, and uh, of course, last semester we went over instructional design. Yeah, so 
I, I remember, you know, uh, I think I, I think I really struck gold when, you know, I think I was in the right place. I knew I was in the right place uh, when we were in technical writing class with Gilly. Remember that Astrolabe class? You guys remember that? How did yeah, you that was awesome. turn out? I love that class. <laughs> it's like arts and crafts. Arts and yeah, crafts. I actually, I did have a good time in that class, and I especially had fun with like that. Uh, mousetrap uh instruction set that we had to develop to like that first class yeah I, you know, I, I think i remember talking about that in like one of kelsey's lectures with one of like her previous students or something like that oh so you were prepared for the mousetrap no like we like the one that we someone spoke about it like this year oh um, and like refresh my memory on it i kind of had like forgotten about it but uh that was like the real first introduction to tech writing and instructional design it's kind of cool yeah, it was fun. I think that was the first class I had Gil just spinning. His mind just about like, you know, flew off his head, man. I'll tell you, off his shoulders, I guess, right? So, uh, so yeah, you know, I mean, that's, you know, basically the, the root. And I could see why they did a lot of the ordering of, uh, of our content uh, throughout our four-year uh, course load, right? So, so Kirk, you talked about your uh, experiences in the field with animation and contemporary codes. Um, you got absorbed by corporate at one point. Um, and so you kind of had like your own, um, I guess, setting in the teaching realm and instructional design. Uh, and then you said you had a great experience as you kind of struck gold with this, uh, with schooling and, and coming into the information design program. I just want to know if uh, your views on instructional design has changed since entering the program, or if you see any differences in the approaches uh, that you've had since coming here, uh, and if it varies from beforehand versus now. Uh, to really answer that, I think it's it's just made me more well-rounded. You know, again, as I mentioned, I, I was faking it till I made it, I guess. Fake it till you make it, right? Uh, and I guess I learned as I went. You know, I had a lot of uh, situations where I was part of a team. And it was a great team because there was one person I actually kind of chose as a mentor, to be honest with you. Uh, his name was David, and he was really cool. He was really willing to share. And I think we just had a lot of fun in, in general. But um we did a lot of uh, train the trainer sessions, if that makes sense, so that we were always consolidated in our, our training uh, so that everyone got the same message in the end. And, you know, you repeat a few things. Like, again, they didn't just kind of throw me in in the water with, uh, with the sharks, if that makes sense. They kind of kept me on the, the very shallow end of, of training. So I used to teach Excel introduction, word introduction, you know, maybe some of the new hire uh, uh, sessions that they would post out there and stuff like that. Uh, I remember I did another session, it was a lunch and learn, where I would teach people how to use a smart board for an hour, right? And it was a really small segue into getting into other uh, venues where I was teaching advanced Excel macros as I studied more course content. Um, I was designing Photoshop courses at the U of C continuing ed uh, area. And then I was uh, also facilitator to, you know, uh, these month long, month long, weekly sessions or whatever with uh, people that were lesser fortunate and were trying to uh, develop skill sets to get into the office workplace or develop the confidence to at least apply, uh, learning just the simple office tools and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I think now that you know, as I you know, again, keep saying the same thing, I, I faked it till I made it. Uh, now that I've gone through the course load here at MRU, I understand the other side of the the content creation right and so uh when it comes to a lot of the uh i guess the instructional design behind uh how you approach a course or how do you get people interested in it how do you advertise it uh you know what's inside and how much of a co course uh load do you pr present on people how do you section it up uh again i've learned through mru and i feel far more diverse in skill set I think something to add to, like, uh, since we're on the topic of issues, was that I, coming from, an I, prior to Mount Royal, I graduated as an engineer in green building and sustainability. So I have an engineering background. And um, definitely, I do see a lot of the issues that was uh, taught and brought to our attention during Gil's technical writing class or, like, other classes like info architecture, you know, um, or usability where, you know, there's always this complaint where the manuals are too thick, there's too much wording and everything. But as an engineer, I also know that there's a huge issue with that because there's a lot of information that also needs to be included. So you kind of like fall into this little paradox of, I need to include this pile of information. At the same time, I want it to be condensed to this 
like tiny amount of like you know condensed information where it's like three to four sentences or just a paragraph to make it more readable right so definitely that was one of the major issues that i saw and i faced and i personally experienced because the way i wrote was very much like an engineer which was very long-winded and monotone i guess you could say i don't know how about you guys do you guys find any other issues um before like you were introduced to tech writing info art where you kind of like were blessed with this skill to kind of strategically condense all the important information to a more readable scannable you know resource um i think that like even before i came into info design it was always just kind of like my objective like i, I like to uh, being able to take complex materials and explain them in a more simplified, efficient manner. Um, and even when I'm just like having a conversation, say with like my family or especially my dad, when we're getting into like a heated discussion or debate or whatever, it's always nice to be able to take like a complex issue and refine it. And so like, especially something that he's totally not familiar with or more contemporary problems that he doesn't like involve himself with on a regular basis. Um, I kind of had that mindset before going into it, but info design and all these tech writing courses and everything kind of within that realm uh, helped me like refine it and understand that that was actually like a passion, but not necessarily like a passion, but something that I like getting out of myself where there's like a pride sense to it, you know, kind of thing. I don't know if you guys feel that same way, but. So. Yeah, it was really neat to kind of see the, you know, if we're making a mind map or something, if we're using those terms, uh, the connection between info, information architecture uh, and how that leads into uh, good uh, course content development. I think like, especially when it comes down to um, like efficiency and training versus education, like like the difference basically between both is that um, with education, there's more opportunity for like growth and innovation. Whereas like training, it's a very limited, um, sort of overview of the subject at hand. So like people think um, sort of when they're training somebody that it's more efficient because it's taking less time. But really I think that if you put in the time like to educate somebody on what they're learning in, in the grand scheme of things, it um, ends up being more efficient, you know, cause they have a more um, well-rounded perspective of the subject, meaning that they'll like have to ask less questions um, in the future, so. I think that's an important sort of topic to distinguish or difference, I guess. Yeah, totally. And I think that um, like having a course that's like we're talking about having it concise and condensed and all of that, but also I think how a course is organized can really contribute to how like how a student benefits from it. So there's like the UDL guidelines, the universal design for learning it's like a framework, right? And that um, kind of like narrows down engagement, representations, and then action and expression. So I feel like if a course is organized properly, um, it's just a lot more efficient as a learner as well. Yeah, I agree with that. That was another thing I really enjoyed about, you know, our, our one class there. Uh, is how do you drum up the interest? You know, how do you, again, we we're talking about, you know, education versus training, right? And again, I think, I think, yeah, it, it was, it was kind of interesting to actually think about that, right? And so, you know, how do you take an educated core of individuals, right? And then train them on new things, you know, how do you keep them up to date in, in up to date or engaged with tools or uh, different methods or, you know, uh, corporate uh, specific uh, approach, things like that, right? And how do you, how do you drum up that, that, that interest, because again, you know, I say, you know, you always want to consider people's time, especially in a busy corporate sector, right? And uh, how do you how do you make them interested to kind of sacrifice a, a lunchtime, for example, to learn how to use a smart board, right? Uh, and you know, you got to give them, you got to present them with value. Uh, I guess it was always kind of one of the big ringers, I suppose, right? So uh, learn how to do a, a smart board, for instance, right? How to use it better or more effectively. Uh, you know, these people became landmarks as to 
uh, hey, you want to go to this person's meeting because they were very fast and efficient in how they conveyed their point and things like that, right? So you always wanted to kind of broadcast or advertise the, uh, uh, you know, in, in some appealing way that the efficiencies that they could perform on their day-to-day -day basis, have it going or undergone the training, right? Uh, you know, if you learn a few new Excel tips and tricks over a lunchtime, again, just using that, that scenario, um, just think how much time that saves in your, you know, day-to-day -day regular job, right? And so uh, that's what we used to focus on when we were out there anyway. Well, in terms of efficiencies. Um, at one point you said something about uh, like knowing your audience, right? Like that's kind of what you're saying is how are we going to engage people? And I'd say like knowing your audience um, would be a big step towards the, the right direction. So like that Addy model, would that be like the analysis phase, right? Absolutely. You know, and again, I think it's again, back to the ever popular persona development, right? You know, it's mm -hmm. one of my favorite parts. I think uh, yeah. have, having experience out in the field, right? I, 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 I don't know. I like doing that, the analysis, I suppose, right? We were talking about all those other things last episode, right? And uh, yeah, knowing your audience is, is very key in this whole scenario. Uh, again, something we approached in instructional design, right? Um, I think also, like, when you're, whether it's training or educating people, like, um, creating, like, um, I guess, relevance is the most important thing because um like if people can't relate to what they're learning they're not going to remember it or use it in their lives um so i think that's like yeah it's just a key thing for for trying to sort of um, hook people in and um also providing options to like um like some people may use it for this some people may use it for that but in the grand scheme of things it's like a multi-purpose sort of thing they're learning yeah, I never really uh, considered that. So yeah, you bring up a really great point actually on that for sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, in a nutshell, you know, when it comes to, I don't know, really that analysis portion as you brought up, Caitlin, um, really it's just time and interest. You know, those are the really some of the tallest hurdles. And, you know, and, and Laura, like you said, implementation down the, down, the long, uh, down the future or down the road, right? So yeah, absolutely. What's interesting about instructional design, as I'm like looking at those phases, is it kind of embodies everything that we've learned throughout our program, right? Like we get to make personas, make a timeline, you know, problem solve, brainstorm, some of those time, like those learning constraints that might exist. Uh, you get to storyboard, you get your visual and your technical design. Like it's pretty much everything that we want all kind of put together. Yeah, I never really, uh, like, again, as I'm learning the other side of the whole learning process, again, I used to just execute on plan, right? Someone else would go behind the scenes and do the technical writing and the research for the course and the needs, the analysis, all that sort of stuff. It's just, again, I feel so much stronger walking into the field knowing those processes. It'll probably even build me as a trainer out there in the field as well if I decide to go back to it. Again, there's a, there's a high payoff. You know, it's nice when you're uh audience really enjoyed their time and got extreme value out of it again that word value right yeah it's interesting that you mentioned that to caitlin uh where you say it kind of encompasses a lot of things that we learn uh in instructional design because if you think about it what we learn in usability where you kind of like make you know sure the websites or the medium equipment or whatever it is information is kind of like targeted properly in terms of language towards the certain demographic and yeah i think that's very important and along with like once again i mentioned intercultural communication just knowing the proper language the proper terminologies to use depending on who are you talking to are you talking to an audience of engineers an audience of people who want to start bike riding or experienced bike riders so i think that is definitely very interesting now that, you know, as four years, when we take a step back, we're like, oh, there's actually a lot that was taught in instructional design. I think there's also like a lot to be said about like the way that us as info designers, the way that we've learned to understand and like absorb information and actually talking to like industry professionals, like even if it's not something that we necessarily are experts on. 
having the ability to understand like what they're talking about or just have a general idea and be able to take what they're saying, um, understand it enough or understand like where they're coming from and how to describe what they're talking about and, put, and implement that. Um, I think that's a huge kind of uh, uh, like model to put on info designers. Yeah, and speaking of models, uh, you know, I, I guess moving on, you know, the approaches and the tools, you know, we were talking about uh, Caitlin's, uh, you know, when it came to those learning theories, again, I'm, I'm like so happy to have that resource. I know we built it. I'm not sure if we're allowed to share it. I wonder if it's just more for our uh, uh, consumption or whatever, our resource, I suppose, right? But uh, uh, yeah, I had uh, one more in the realm of storytelling. Right. That's the one I studied. And uh, I I thoroughly embrace that, actually, you know, because I uh, I guess we're talking about value, things like that. And I found it very easy to convince people of the value of what they're learning through storytelling, I suppose. Right. Uh, you know how it's going to enrich their life, how it's going to, uh, you know, enhance or make efficient their day or their workflow. Uh, and, and I would always provide scenarios. Right. So. Uh, I think I think that just made everything kind of sell easier and things like that. But uh, uh, yeah, the learning theories I, again. I'm you know I certainly personally have one. I don't know what which one everyone was responsible for, but uh, every time I dipped in there on as we did sub, sub, uh, subsequent uh, 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 assignments, sorry, uh, and and kind of just applied some of those those learning theories. Uh, it really did kind of open up new doors as to how I would uh, consider approaches in, in instructional design actually. Uh, yeah, I think it might be one of those things where if you think back to even earlier on in the degree and how we've been taught things, like those um, <clears throat> learning theories, have, have they've taken place and they've always been present and we don't necessarily uh, realize until now that we've learned about it, right? Like, uh, I think the one that I did was scaffolding. So it's like an educator is there at the beginning, they kind of walk you through something, maybe it's a tutorial type situation. Uh, and then maybe you try it on your own, but they're still kind of like in the background if you have any questions. So um, that kind of reminded me of like even our usability, um, usability course, stuff like that, where they've, you know, they do, it's present, it's there, but we just didn't know about it until we learned about it, at least for me. Um, all these learning theories kind of goes to show how much, how many options we have when it comes to teaching people. And depending on our audience, we can kind of change how we teach them um, when it comes to the learning theories that we have provided. Um, there's just a huge range when it comes to teaching people. So um, there's not just one way to do something in this kind of environment, especially. And I think you bring up a, a good point there, uh, having a wide range in teaching. So going back to what we were talking about before, you know, training versus education, I think that brings up a really good point because when we're talking about training, I feel in my eyes, I see training as kind of doing a one task kind of thing. You're training to do this one task and this one outcome versus education has a whole range, right? We're talking about um, storytelling, uh, relevance, UDL guidelines and the ADI process. Um, I, I feel like those are things that people can be educated on. And Kirk, you were talking about your experiences uh, before you came to the program and how you brought personality to the table when you were teaching. Um, and I think that is a big aspect of teaching. People will learn and people will probably be more motivated to learn a whole umbrella of things versus doing a one task uh, sort of thing. So maybe a barrier in instructional design could be um, training versus educating. Um, uh, of course, there's many different approaches to educating, but that would maybe narrow down to what someone is motivated by and, uh, and how they would actually, uh, I guess, absorb the topics at hand. No, absolutely. And again, that, that probably segues into uh, the topic of synchronous versus asynchronous, right? You know, I think a lot of people find it an extreme drag, for instance, to do this online e-learning. So again, you know, I would, you know, as I was developing those particulars uh, in my in my past or whatever, uh, we would consider the audience. I know I at least did that, and uh, I didn't fake that, I guess. 
you know, what's going to be entertaining for them, I guess, in so many words, what's going to entice them to kind of keep plugging or pushing the buttons or actually comprehending the material being presented to them. So we used all sorts of different multimedia tricks and things like that. And, you know, I guess, yeah, I now know uh, that I can apply some more of those, those learning theories instead of just kind of going, oh, we got a really cool toy that you could push a button to, right? Or we have a drag and drop, so that'll break up the, the, the action or the tedium, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think we would, I would better rehearse that, you know, developing through like a, a needs assessment, you know, if I was doing some kind of uh, asynchronous delivery system, you know, through e-learning and things like that. I would probably dig down into more of the culture of uh, the the whatever the work group in this big corporation or uh, the audience being whether it be wide or very narrow internally things like that. Uh, I think I, I I think I'm better equipped to kind of apply those sort of that that approach I guess at least developing what they need right and then when it comes to synchronous and again yeah uh, Shadi I mean it. It truly really does. It does take a, a personality. It really does. You have to be kind of entertaining up there. Uh, I used to always liking what I was doing up there. You know, just teaching Excel, uh, just just almost like late night. I used to say this. I know it sounds funny, but it's like almost like late night comedy or something like that. Talk show comedy. You know, I would have to stay entertaining. You know, kind of get a laugh out of the out of the out of the out of the room once in a while, right? And just make sure that you know they were always paying attention to what message I had to deliver. And back to like what everybody has mentioned and in the variety of like ways we can approach instructional or technical writing. Um, it's definitely very eye-opening for me being uh, coming from an engineering background and all the work I used to do was engineering and trades related because I always thought that, you know, the only way you can teach engineers is everybody's perspective was like, oh, engineers are boring people who can sit down and read like pages and pages and pages of information and, you know, technical stuff and all this kind of, uh, all that jazz. But like now after going through information design and learning the various, you know, skills and things and ways of thinking, uh, I realized that actually you can be very visual with let's say a group of engineers, you know, and you can be very not visual with a bunch of creatives, let's say, you know, content creators could read, you know, these huge chunks of like words, whereas engineers, maybe if you had it more visual, it's a better way to teach them. And it's just very interesting when you kind of think about it, because it's, you know, this, you know, the more you open up your mind, the more different ways of approaching instructional design, the more, you know, different angles, I guess you look at it, you know, the more ways you kind of discover like how to really tackle all the issues and barriers that there is. Kirk, I have a, a question for you. I know you spoke about how before the program you did quite a bit of instructional design. Um, so in Kelsey's class, we did a more formal version of that for you, I suppose. Um, how did you approach that differently than you used to? Uh, I think it's really the planning behind the scenes, really. Uh, again, through my whatever, I keep saying the same thing, fake it till I make it sort of thing. Again, I, I, I was really focused on a lot of just, just, I was really just focused on the material and the material delivery, right? Just how would I make this entertaining, right? And I guess I've kind of thrown over my shoulder the whole entertainment first uh, approach, I guess is the best way to put it. And obviously uh, acquired a lot more depth into how the, the content has been uh, generated or created and, you know, better means to get that message across. So uh, I think I would focus more now out in the field again on, on focusing on those personas, making sure I hit those targets and uh, maybe being more visual with things. You know, I, I really like how you could start with a, a high level overview of things and just narrow down to the topics that pertain to them. So, you know, maybe you kind of uh, give them a wash over of, hey, here's the big thing. Here's the big picture, everyone. This is what you're going to walk out with. And we're going to narrow down to these subtopics. And then we, you know, everyone understands where we are on the map of, of learning or training, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like you were almost more focused on engagement. And now you're stepping into those other steps of, you know, representation and then action and expression. 
I've just been thinking of like tools and stuff that like people are learning for this and like how like there's like a huge market for and like a e like an e-learning space for all these programs like X Mind and all these things that help like teams and stuff uh, learn together remotely that have been developed because of like COVID and stuff, ads and everything for it everywhere. Interesting. Yeah, like I think the whole keeping interesting also is evolving, like you said, right? Because, you know, COVID's a, a thing and people are now becoming maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll ask you guys, like, do you think people are becoming more tolerant to, you know, online synchronous or uh, asynchronous kind of learning systems? Or uh, you think people want something new or are people just losing their mind at this rate? What are we, a year into the pandemic and some change, right? Oh, yeah, I, I think that people that have been going into the office uh, like for a few like years now are sick and tired of having to do the commute and stuff. So that it's like a happy relief for them. But to have to like stay there all the time, it, it then becomes like a different office space. So like people want to have the choice to be able to go into the office or stay at home and do the e-learning thing or work online kind of thing. Well, well I, I, I agree to an extent because, I mean, people are – uh, I hear all different perspectives on that kind of thing, right? Like some people hate it. Some people like this online kind of format. I think the big thing that you mentioned is the choice. Uh, people don't really have the choice to go back. You know what I mean? They have to stay yeah. here. The social life isn't really a choice right now. And I think that's the big problem. Me personally, um, I say it a lot, but I was the kind of guy that wouldn't go to class because I didn't want to wake up and go to class. So <laughs> I would skip for that reason. But uh, this makes it a lot easier for me because uh, I, I have everything accessible in one place, one location. Uh, I would enjoy a social life out there. And, you know, for the people that have been going to offices their entire lives and now stuck at home, maybe this is a, a better thing for them as well. But I think having that choice would probably balance it, right? But again, it's, it's difficult because everyone's making the shift to this online uh, digital kind of world that we're going into now. So it's, uh, it's probably going to affect a lot of the way we do things, including instructional design, right? So well, it's so much easier and efficient, right? To actually yeah. be able to talk to somebody in person, walk down to their cubicle or whatever you can do, and get the point across in 30 seconds rather than 30 emails. That's funny that you say that at my work. It's been, I've had the exact opposite experience. Really? It's like at an all time high. I've got my boss like texting me and we've uh, we really amped it up. It's been great. Yeah, I guess it kind of pushes more so. Uh, especially like managers and owners and that to be a lot more communicative uh, to their staff and out there or like contractors and everything like that too. So that makes a lot more sense. So do you think this, this kind of shift would, let's go back to the topic of instructional design, for example. Um, let's say you just got hired um, online, you're working remotely. Uh, you've never actually met your boss or whoever's hiring you. You had an online interview um, and they kind of hand you a pamphlet or kind of like a page and say, hey, this is what you're going to be doing. Um, read this and kind of learn. And do you think that kind of negatively, this kind of shift to this digital world is going to negatively affect the way we uh, can instruct others or teach others or use instructional design? Or do you think it's going to be uh, more beneficial, you know, compared to someone in a classroom kind of teaching and going through all the different ways that we can do things? I think it depends on who's behind the instructional design. Like if you have a good instructional designer, then you know that transition will probably be a lot easier. <laughs> I think personally, it's a good thing because it forces people to actually be very accurate and concise and to the point to what, you know, for example, if it's a job description, exactly what am I going to do? A, B, C, rather than beat around the bush, and suddenly D is, you know, in, <laughs> slide in and you're like, I didn't know I had this other responsibility. So I think it's a good thing from my perspective. What do you think? Yeah, I think it depends on the instructional designer behind the entire thing as well. But then it goes back to that training versus education thing. And, you know, Kirk was able to bring in his personality to teaching before, right? But maybe people find that a little more difficult. Like there's a lot more aspects that you have to consider in an online format versus an in-person format, right? Someone who's been doing something in person for the last 25 years might find it difficult to do something online. And it could be just as simple as something as your personality doesn't show, right? Um, maybe your empathy towards it. So maybe a question I have towards you guys is, in, as information designers in general, 
do you think we kind of have an upper hand since we've done the in-person thing? We've done it online. We know how to instruct people online. Um, and going through COVID now completely online, do you think that we kind of have an upper hand on this instructional design environment going into the future here? Uh, I'll I speak just... to that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sorry to cut you off, Wyatt, but uh, like I, I think, you know, as we were talking about efficiencies and all those sort of, sort of things, like, uh, you know, think about think about how we approached one of our one of our assignments there, where uh, we all kind of learned about different learning environments, different tools that are out there in the virtual space, right? And uh, how the world might have to adjust to that. So I think, yeah, we've got an extreme edge as fresh information designer uh, students walking out into the field with these fresh new ideas and perspectives. You know, um, just so look how how great. Uh, you you were exposed to all these different learning environments just through video for format, for example, right? So again, as Arthur said or mentioned earlier, that we could just cut to the chase. You know, you can cut out all the flat. You know, maybe there is a little personality that jazzes that up as we kind of you know as we were, you know if I reflect back to our gravity sketch, we kind of had a little funny uh, conclusion. You know, but we took them on a path, a very fast and efficient path. Like, hey, you can use this tool. Uh, to learn some new things, and it's a uh, it, it, you know you can collaborate and kind of create these awesome prototypes, and here's the end result. And we did all of that in five minutes instead of a full uh, synchronous session where I take like I'd eat up half a day on someone, if not a full day, uh, to sit and learn some new things. Right. So it was really, you know, that is interesting to bring that up. I just wanted to talk about like the the previous kind of topic, but how it all relates to it. this is all kind of one thing. Um, but that it actually like this situation evolves how companies, depending on their size, how they actually go through the process of like onboarding or transitioning um, employees and stuff or taking on different responsibilities and that as well, where they're using different programs or implementing different strategies and they're thinking differently and a lot more efficiently so that their money that's a lot shorter now can work for them more effectively too right so there's like the there's the business side of everything that info designers take into account too and efficiency not only takes into account like design principles but it also takes into account like the company's bank account really and like their resources brilliant yeah you'll be popular in the boardroom meetings on on instructional design as long as you're, you're saving people money you know you'll have everyone's interest <laughs> that way absolutely absolutely exactly. that um, kind of going off that too um online learning allows for a lot of newer technologies, like especially like AR and VR, more so introducing it to different companies or different people, or even in like a school learning environment like we did, kind of playing around with stuff like that. So it definitely opens up a new world of ideas, uh, especially if you wanna stay away from the classic, like Google Meet or Zoom or something like that and kind of expand your horizons. How do you measure effectiveness of a of a course? Well, there's formative and summative. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, there it is. Right. Yeah. What do those mean? Refresh my memory. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a thing. Learning you know, about I, those at all. Each stage. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I believe formative was to be assessed at each stage, whereas summative was something that you could like give the learner, and it would. Um, it would have like a set criteria and it'd be an opportunity to get feedback from. Right. Um, I remember that from like UX or something. Where would this fit? Because like quite bluntly uh, at the end of my sessions now, you know, I'm kind of starting to see t the importance of it. You know, I, I kind of just took it in as like my score, you know, it will give me five out of five. So I must have been entertaining, I guess, uh, that day. <laughs> Uh, when it came to the evaluation portion from, from my, my past students, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, so yeah, what would that, that would squeeze in, like, what would be the, I guess the, the more uh, intelligent way to kind of think around that evaluation process? Because we did use that to really uh, judge the instructor is one thing, uh, but, or, you know, where else would they fit or align with certain different clientele? Because I would be placed all over the city really at one point, but um, yeah, that evalu evaluation feedback, I mean, it was so critical so that we can actually make uh, the course better, I guess, in so many words, right? So I know, like, you know, having gone through this course load, you know, like, I know I've evolved. Uh, if I was to, you know, maybe return to the same uh, 
a career path, I suppose, right? You know, um, I, I've evolved from just being in the to actually having a full grip of the process behind the scenes and uh, right down to the evaluation at the end, right? And, uh, you know, hopefully make myself a better instructional designer, I suppose. Now I can hold or possess the uh, ability to genuinely change the, the core structure uh, with, with merit, I suppose, now. Well, we had some good points brought up today, and it looks like we're out of time. Uh, but thank you all for participating, and thank you all at home for tuning in today. Uh, we have some key takeaways. You know, uh, we have evaluation, formative versus summative approaches, uh, efficiencies and effectiveness of learning, um, different approaches, use of personas, different learning theories, and of course, understanding education versus training. Uh, we hope you've all enjoyed and learned about how to become the best designer you can be. Uh, we encourage you to join us next week and apply these topics in your profession, of course, by any means necessary. Thank you.